to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Let's talk about the ways different medications affect testosterone. We've spent a lot of time going over the pathways that take GHRH to GH and IGF-1 and the multiple stimulatory and inhibitory components involved. So let's switch gears a bit and do the same with testosterone. We're going to talk about medications that include Clomid, HCG, and HMG. And the goal here is to actually understand what these compounds do and how they interact with this intricate pathway that's gained a lot of attention within popular media and in healthcare clinics over the past few years. This video isn't going to be as much of a deep dive as others, but more broad in coverage. A TRT alternative for dummies video, if you will. So you'll see a lot of comments in online communities saying that if you want to increase testosterone, just take testosterone. And I do feel there's some merit to that sentiment, although there certainly exist reasons why perhaps it's worth taking things more slowly or starting with alternatives as some people prefer. So total testosterone looked at in isolation is quite complex. With such a large range of what is quote-unquote normal, it's hard to account for not only such drastic differences in numerical measurements, but also the ever-complexity of individual variability. Not to mention levels can fluctuate due to factors like time of day, age, and individual differences including exercise regimen, BMI, and other factors, makes interpreting testosterone measurements tricky. And testosterone levels tend to be highest in the morning, which is why blood tests are typically done early to minimize variability, and to try to get a true number, essentially. Why is testosterone of interest? Well, its influences are diverse and augmenting such is oftentimes desirable. Things like muscle growth, mood, libido are among some of the processes with which testosterone is interwoven among many other palpable and more physiologic functions. Now, like with many hormonal pathways, it begins in the hypothalamus with pulsatile secretion of GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone. GnRH travels to the anterior pituitary and stimulates release of two other key hormones involved, LH, which is luteinizing hormone, and FSH, which is follicle-stimulating hormone. When it comes to testosterone production itself, LH is more directly implicated. It binds to receptors on the Leydig cells within the testes and in a multi-step process stimulates production of testosterone. FSH predominantly stimulates another cell type called Sertoli cells to facilitate components of spermatogenesis and plays a primary role in reproductive function. After testosterone is produced, SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, binds the majority of it, while albumin binds a smaller portion, both of which facilitate transport of testosterone to target tissues and muscles. And like with most of these hormonal pathways, negative feedback plays a crucial role in its regulation. This prevents overutility as well as desensitization. So if testosterone levels are high, ultimately GnRH and LH production are halted. Similarly, Sertoli cells in the testes secrete inhibin in response to FSH stimulation, which specifically reduces further FSH release. This two-pronged feedback mechanism keeps the system in check, preventing overproduction of testosterone while maintaining reproductive health in an otherwise healthy person. Now, to no surprise, as we've all heard plenty of times, lifestyle factors play a role in GnRH secretion. For instance, sleep, exercise are both stimulatory and why they're oftentimes sought to be maximized before starting exogenous testosterone replacement. Moreover, stress, obesity, poor sleep, and of course exogenous steroid administration will all lead the body to decrease its own production of testosterone. Another relationship worth mentioning is the one that testosterone shares with estrogen through aromatization, a process catalyzed by the enzyme bum 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 aromatase. This primarily occurs in adipose tissue, which explains why individuals with higher body fat levels often have elevated estrogen too. Within the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, estrogen provides negative feedback to gonadotropin-releasing hormone. So higher estrogen levels suppress luteinizing hormone and testosterone production, while lower estrogen levels can reduce this suppression, potentially leading to overstimulation of testosterone production, which leads us to Clomid, or Clomiphene, which is clinically used to treat infertility and polycystic ovarian syndrome in women. In men, it's often prescribed off-label to increase testosterone production and availability. Clomid is a Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulator, a SERM, which is important not to get confused with Selective Androgen Receptor Modulators, which are SARMs, some of which we've done videos on, make sure to watch those, which target androgen receptors in particular. So Clomid works by blocking estrogen receptors in the hypothalamus and pituitary, which mimics a state of lower estrogen levels. This lack of estrogen detection stimulates the hypothalamus to increase 
secretion of GnRH, which leads to higher levels of luteinizing hormone from the pituitary and consequently enhanced testosterone production in the gonads. And although it sounds harmless, using Clomid as a monotherapy isn't without risks. So by blocking estrogen, Clomid may lower estrogen levels too much, which can lead to side effects like mood changes, irritability, and even bone health issues like increased risk for osteoporosis. And this is because estrogen is a regulatory factor of bone density. Additionally, Clomid's impact on estrogen could accelerate the progression of pre-existing prostate conditions. And so while Clomid use leads to increased luteinizing hormone and testosterone production, it can also elevate estrogen levels through aromatization, which could result in more symptoms consistent with its side effect profile. HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin, is something we've discussed before and it's gained a lot of attention in the testosterone optimization community, especially as a way to, quote, salvage the testes. When individuals use exogenous steroids or testosterone, their natural production declines because the body no longer needs the testes to produce testosterone. The testicles are essentially, for lack of a better word, uh, they're out of a job. So as a result, they shrink and atrophy since the injected testosterone takes over. HCG, which is derived from the urine of pregnant women, is an LH luteinizing hormone mimetic. So it mimics the action of luteinizing hormone, which normally binds to receptors in the testes and stimulates stimulates testosterone production. Due to this role, HCG is often used as an adjunct to TRT to help preserve intratesticular testosterone production, which is also key for spermatogenesis or sperm production and maintaining fertility. Some people also use HCG as a monotherapy for boosting testosterone. I know Dr. Peter Atia was talking about doing this, particularly for those new to the process or those who want to feel better while keeping their fertility intact and avoiding the risks associated with exogenous testosterone administration. HCG is generally less potent than TRT, testosterone replacement therapy with testosterone itself self often requiring a more frequent dosing regimen. However, one thing to note is that HCG can potentially suppress GnRH, which could impact the natural production of testosterone if HCG is stopped. This happens because of the good old negative feedback mechanism, because the hypothalamus perceives HCG as LH, leading to a decrease in GnRH secretion. So if HCG is discontinued, it may cause a delay in the restart of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, slowing the natural resumption of production of testosterone. HMG, or human menopausal gonadotropin, is another compound that started to get more attention in these same circles of fertility and testosterone optimization. It's derived from the urine of postmenopausal women and contains both luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, which are both crucial for regulating testosterone and sperm production alike. Each formulation of the compound most typically has an LH to FSH ratio of 1 to 1. When it comes to testosterone, testosterone optimization, HMG is often used as an adjunct or even as a monotherapy to help preserve or restore natural testosterone production. And while HCG mimics LH to stimulate testosterone production in the Leydig cells of the testes, HMG also provides FSH to the picture, which not only helps boost testosterone because of this LH presence, but also plays a key role in sperm production. Thus, just like people turn to HCG for the same reason, they may turn to HMG as well as an option to hopefully maintain maintain fertility while on TRT or anabolic steroids. And that's the reason why some people actually prefer HMG over HCG because of this combination of both LH and FSH, which together could not only increase testosterone, but also more broadly support sperm development and reproduction. But similar to HCG and Clomid for this matter, HMG is less potent than exogenous testosterone, and thus it often requires more frequent dosing to get the desired results or numerical measurements. And the same concern we had about HCG, where it is still suppressive in nature, applies to HMG as well. Because of our endogenous hormonal systems recognize this increase in LH and FSH, essentially it'll lead to suppressive action against gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which which in the long run, depending on use, if somebody were to stop, could hinder processes of reproduction ultimately. And so these reasons combined are why a lot of people say, hey, if you're going to boost testosterone, just use testosterone because no matter what you do, it'll likely be in some way or another 
suppressive. And this is also what people mean when they say, oh, HCG is suppressive, HMG is suppressive. That upstream, given long enough duration of use, there will likely be suppression of GnRH and endogenous production of LH, FSH, and testosterone as a result. So a lot of people's choice ultimately comes down to, will they tolerate needles? Will they tolerate the compound? What and how much of each side effect profile is tolerable, as well as other metrics? Right, things like blood pressure, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and other basic lab measurements are ones that are considered when jumping on some sort of alternative to TRT or TRT with testosterone in and of itself. And hopefully this video also provided an understanding as to why all these different labs are important. If you want a video on different types of hypogonadism, whether primary, secondary, and what these different lab measurements actually mean, I'm happy to do that. Or if you want to hear about any of these other other compounds in more detail. We did do a full video on HCG. Just let me know. And if you haven't already, hit that like and subscribe button. It's the best way to help me out. I truly appreciate it. And I want to wish you a happy holidays, happy new year, and thank you for watching. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.